Um, one thing that I've become very interested in is the work that's being done in neuroscience, which at the moment is backing up a lot of things that we coaches feel we've known for a long, long time. Um, and uh, it, 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 particularly in areas like um, goal setting, for instance, for a long time there's been a sports method of setting, of, um, uh, in terms of setting goals for performance. There's been a sports technique of imagining that you're hitting the winning shot. And they find that when sports people imagine that they will go through all of the paces of hitting the winning shot and see the ball go wherever it has to go and hear the roar of the crowd and all of it, um, it actually makes them more likely to hit the winning shot in real life. And of course now neuroscience has proved that we're actually, when we imagine things, we're creating neural pathways. And the brain can't tell frack from friction, which is why we cry at weepy movies. And once the neural pathway is there, it's a lot easier to do something that you've done before and you've created a habit to hit the winning shot. So it becomes easier. That's, that's the sort of interesting stuff that's coming out of neuroscience. Um, one particular area I've researched a lot about is uh, bullying, because I've quite often been asked to come in and fix the bully because the bully was achieving a great deal in the company, but people were leaving because of the bully. And so um, the company didn't want to lose the person, but they wanted to resolve the way the person was behaving. So there's been a lot of research done by neuroscientists into psychopaths, into the, and it's been found that psychopaths tend to have a certain brain formation, which is a completely dark prefrontal cortex. And further research showed that uh, something like 40% of the world business leaders, the world's business leaders have this dark prefrontal cortex, thereby proving the theory that an awful lot of people who are run companies and you, that you work for are psychopaths. Um, but the research has also showed that not everybody with a dark prefrontal cortex is going chopping people up or terribly unpopular or whatever. They do tend to have certain tendencies that may be less empathy with people and probably that's what makes them good leaders, that they can make tough decisions about sacking a whole load of people and so on. Uh, but why aren't they chopping people up? And the theory is that um, although the um, nature may have given them these, this brain formation, it's triggered in it to, to turn them into a psychopathic killer, that will be triggered by childhood abuse or something, or a, a severe um, trauma of, of, that, that they will have suffered. And so they won't actually start going out and doing physical damage until the, the trigger is, the switch is triggered um, to make them go out and damage other people. So we are surrounded by psychopaths, but we're quite safe. And I thought that um, this was very interesting in terms of my work with bullies because it backed up the fact that these people changed. They were able to change. A lot of the time, they didn't really like being bullies. They had been perhaps raised in a bullying atmosphere. The only role models they'd had to learn their communication skills were bullies. They learned these skills and of, of course, it, 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 at school and so on as they grew up, they'd get a very bad reaction from other people, not having learned good communication skills. And as a defence, they found bullying thing was the only skill they had that worked. So they became bullies and went on and through work and so on. It still worked. It still works being a bully because it can protect you to a certain extent. But without exception, all the bullies I've worked with, when underneath it all, when the, when the walls came down and they really revealed them, themselves when, the, when we'd created enough trust for that to happen, um, they wanted to change. They wanted to be liked. They wanted to be like other people and get on with people. And so... Um, Partly the realisation of that was enough to help them and partly I, I found giving them coaching skills was really useful um, and you know, send them on a train, coach training course, give them the skills that they've never had the opportunity to learn. And all of that's been backed up by neuroscience so I, I continue to watch neuroscience. Uh, I think it's a very interesting field. I don't think it's got anything to teach us but it can give us credibility and it can confirm what we've found in our experience. Uh, it's no coincidence that mindfulness is becoming the buzzword in corporations now. Um, there was a time when if you were in a situation you didn't like or in a job you didn't like, you could leave and get another one. And I think the effect of the recession over the last six years um, have, has left a lot of people stuck in situations which they can't control, they're very uncomfortable, 
that they can't change because there are no other jobs available. Also, the, um, the companies more than ever are buying and selling each other and you're in a, some people are in a constant situation of change, which goes from week to week. It's very stressful, it's very hard to manage. And I think the beauty of mindfulness is, it's, um, I mean, it's an ancient practice, you know, thousands of years old, but its core principle is really that you recognize what's happening, you recognize how it's making you feel, you recognize how other people are behaving, you recognize the hopelessness of it, and you don't try and change the way you feel about it. You just recognize all these things. And you find then, when you've actually given them the respect of recognizing them in your mind, then you can function alongside them without these strong emotions overwhelming you. So you're recognizing your strong emotions and feeling of discomfort, then you can function alongside them. And I find that's tremendously helpful to executives. Um, Sir John Whitmore, of course, is the sort of grandfather of coaching. He introduced it into Europe in the 1980s and he introduced the fundamental coaching models which most people are still using today. And he himself has moved further, um, he's, he's, he's moved into trans, what he calls transpersonal coaching. And this is more and more about how we really get to know ourselves. What's the real inner person like? And I think um, it's, it's part of a coaching approach that it, co coaching is, aims to sort of help people be more themselves, identify the self, identify the needs, the talents, the desires, and be more of that and maximise those rather than trying to overlay something else. Um, so hence John's interest in transpersonal coaching. And I was very privileged to be filmed uh, during a transpersonal coaching session delivered by John and it lasted for about 40 minutes and it, he demonstrated the techniques of transpersonal coaching on me and I have to say it was the best coaching session I've ever received and it was all on camera, all filmed on camera. He's very kindly given me permission to include the transcript of that in this book and he has um, a commentary which he's added to it as well explaining what he did, when he did it, why he did it and I've also put some notes um, into the proceedings of what was happening for me and what he was doing. So I think for anybody who wants to become a coach or who is a coach, however experienced, to read through that transcript, I think you learn so much about coaching. I was a very experienced coach when I was coached by him and I really learnt a lot about the fundamentals from doing that session. What I spend most of my time doing now is designing programs for multinational companies and training trainers to go out and deliver them. And we have to work in other, nation in other languages. So I have trainers delivering programs, for instance, in Russia, you know, who live, live, who live in Moscow. And I've had to design programs that sort of one, side, one size fits all um, from everywhere, from Eastern Europe, America, the Middle East, and of course, Western Europe as well. And the beauty of coaching is it is such a fundamental language that I find once people can really understand the coaching space and to understand the coaching attitude, um, it cuts across any cultural differences. Now, there certainly are cultural differences among nationalities. I've actually found there are more cultural differences between, say, different departments, like, say, the head of IT and the head of sales will quite often have a greater cultural difference and miscommunication than the German talking to the Italian. Um, but coaching, again, it's the universal language. It cuts across all of these differences. Now, I've, sometimes we have to make allowances for cultural differences. For instance, um, when we teach people how to listen, we tell them it's very important to look the person in the eye and really show that you're listening. Well, in parts of Africa, it's extremely rude to look someone in the eye when you're talking. So oh, clearly, if you're working in that part of Africa, you mustn't stop looking people in the eye because it just won't wash in that culture. Then again, if you're from that part of Africa and you're coming to work in Europe, you have to start to learn to look people in the eye. Otherwise, they're going to n n not think you're, that they have a very good relationship with you. So the conclusion that I came to really was that cultural differences exist and they need to be respected. Um, so always respect cultural differences, but always challenge them.
because other cultural differences, particularly the very directive form of management, which you very f find very much in Eastern Europe and Russia, um, that, that tends to be just a habit, and a habit can be changed. It's the way they've been brought up, 40 years of com communist rule, it's very directive. And um, a, a, a colleague of mine uh, found this with uh, working with a group of Chinese managers where the, the, the culture is very directive. And the Chinese, she was training them to use a coaching style. And they said, we can't use this. We can't ask our staff. They won't respect us. They will lose face. They, 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 we have to tell them it's what's expected. And she begged her, she said, please, just for me, just try it once. Please go away tonight, try it. And they went away and tried it, and the next time they came back to the session, um, they all said, oh, we like this better, it works better. Um, so I, I'd say always respect cultural differences, always challenge them, because they might just be habits.